I'm glad that I serve a God that loves me so much, the God that cannot change, the God that cannot fail, the God that cannot lie, loves me enough that he can change my circumstances so that I can do what God wants me to do. I know some of you can't read my shirt, and I forgot what it says. It says, Quality Papa, Age to Perfection. The, the age I've got down. Perfection and quality I'm not sure about, but one out of three is not bad. That's pretty good. God's good. Happy Father's Day to all of you fathers. Let's give our fathers a hand. Hallelujah. Amen. And I don't know if you noticed the, the display out there, the, the, the uh, picture drop. It's got a bunch of ties. Some of them came from you because you don't wear them anymore. But it makes a great photo op. So uh, all you guys, fathers, stop and get a picture today. Well, in 1949, NBC Radio aired a sitcom known as Father Knows Best. It aired for six years and then, of course, went to television and was quite popular on TV. As I was thinking, it probably wouldn't be real successful today because it promoted the fathers being the head of the house. And it promoted the father as knowing something about something. And he was the leader of the family, so it probably wouldn't go over too well good today. But isn't it interesting to, that God is known in the scriptures as many, many, many things. On Sunday nights, I've been preaching the I am's of God. And man, it's, a, it's an awesome study of who God is. But one of the better known references to God is our Heavenly Father. When Jesus was asked to teach the disciples how to pray, he starts it with our Father which are in heaven. With that in mind, I think we can all agree that our heavenly Father knows best. Our earthly fathers, I know for me, I've made plenty of mistakes, and my dad made plenty of mistakes, but my heavenly Father has never made a mistake. He always knows, and he knows what's best. I want to read the definition to you out of Unger's Bible Dictionary. The definition of omniscience. And it's really something that's so great that most of us can't comprehend. I can't. What does omniscience mean? It means the divine attribute. I mean, it's godly. So, <clears throat> husbands... Even if your wife thinks go, yours is not the divine attribute. The divine attribute of perfect knowledge. This is declared in Psalms, Proverbs, <coughs> Isaiah, Acts, 1 John, and Hebrews. And in many other places. It also mentions the perfect knowledge of God is exclusively His attribute. Did you catch that? We cannot have this attribute because it's, it's above and beyond us. It includes all things that are actual and all things that are possible. Its possession is incomprehensible. That means it's above our pay grade. And yet it is necessary to our faith in the perfection of God's sovereignty. The revelation of this divine property, like that of others, is well calculated to fill us with profound reverence. It should alarm sinners and beget confidence in the hearts of God's children. That means to help us to become more confident of his grace and his consolation. And then the scriptures unequivocally declare the divine presence at the same time make their appeal to man as a free and consequently responsible being. Now, I don't know if you caught that, but there were some words in there that really are beyond a lot of our comprehension. 
Matter of fact, it says it's incomprehensible. For us to understand the knowledge of God is something we can't do. We can get just a little glimmer. And I know many of you a lot more educated, a lot more intelligent than I am. And you can come to a lot better understanding. But I can tell you that I struggled about sharing this message today. Because in all honesty, it's beyond most of my comprehension or my ability to totally understand what I'm going to try to share with you today. But I tried to bring it down to my level because I'm convinced if I can understand it, you can understand it. So I'm bringing it down to my level. Hopefully I, you don't think I'm, I'm, I'm downplaying it. But I can tell you the omniscience of God is awesome. See, the conflict deals with the sovereignty of man. How many knows that man's sovereign? We have the freedom to choose. We, we're the sovereignty of man and the sovereignty of God. Both are sovereign. But I think most of us will agree that the creator, the sovereignty of the creator is greater than the sovereignty of the created. So that means the sovereignty of God far supersedes our sovereignty. But we do have the freedom of choice. Man can make choices that are contrary to the will of God. Now, I'm not asking you to vote on this this morning. But have any of you ever made a choice that you knew God wasn't pleased with? It was contrary to what you knew was the right choice. Sometimes our choices come from a lack of understanding. Sometimes they come from a lack of education. Sometimes they just come out of disobedience, but we all have made them. And if you hang around me very long, you will hear me make a statement. That any one of you that has never made a stupid mistake, you have my permission to cast the first stone. If you've never made a stupid mistake, you don't have enough rocks to throw at me for every stupid mistake I've made. Our choices. See, the, the reality, like sin... Because the Bible says we all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We've all made wrong choices. And you've heard me say many times that God provides because he can pre-see. That means he's omniscient. He knows before it happens. Half the time, I don't know after it's happened. Huh? But God knows before it happens, and he can see, and he can make arrangements, and he can change things. Now, be careful. Listen to me. I'm not telling you that God changes because God cannot change. He's the same yesterday, day, and forever. He is the same. He is the Alpha, Omega, the beginning and the end. So God does not change. God cannot go against his word. He keeps every promise. And if he can cause all things to work together for good, according to his purpose, he may not change, but he must be able to change circumstances that come about because of our failures and mistakes. Let me give you an example. When Israel left Egypt, now God knew that they needed a little bit of time. They did not take a shortcut. The Bible says they led them a long way around the thing to teach the young men to do war so they would learn how to live not as slaves, but as people. But God's intention was them to go into the promised land 40 years earlier. So God didn't change, but he had to change the circumstances. He had to intervene because circumstances change. God said, all of you are going to die off. A whole generation 
because of disobedience and wrong choices, but primarily an act of rebellion. They did not believe God. How many agree with that? Is that true? Why didn't they go in immediately? Because they made the wrong decisions. Now, I'm going to direct you to a passage of Scripture that I've been dealing with about three or four weeks. Daniel called me yesterday or Friday. It might have been Friday. Or text me, what are you going to preach on Sunday? I said, I don't know. I know what I wanted to preach. I wanted to preach this, but I, don't, I said, I'm not sure I'm ready to preach this. And after preaching at 8 o'clock, I'm still not ready to preach this. But I want to read the passage. The story is shared in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Not going to read the entire passage, but three of them give it. So let's go to the Gospel of Matthew. This takes place the last week of Jesus' ministry. The last week, so I'm sure he was trying to get some points across. The week started with the triumphal entry on Sunday morning. Then he cleansed the temple the next day. They have questioned the authority of Jesus. That amuses me. How can you question the authority of Jesus? But they did. And then we come to chapter 21 of Matthew, begin reading at verse 28. We have two stories that talk about that the parables are specifically talking about the people. What do you think? A man had two sons. And he went to the first and said, son, go and work in the vineyard today. And he answered, I will not. But afterwards he changed his mind and went. And he went to the other son and said the same. And he answered, I go, sir, but did not go. Which of the two did the will of the father? Now they were smart enough to answer that. They said the first. Jesus said to them, truly I say to you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes go into the kingdom of God before you. Now who was he talking to? He was talking to the religious leaders. And he said, you've got one group said they're going to do it, then didn't. And then you got one group said they're not, and then they did. Which one's the son of God? Or which one's the, doing the will of the Father? And what did Jesus tell them? He said, the prostitutes are doing better than you are. The heathens are doing better than you are. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes believed him. And when you saw it, you did not go afterwards, change your minds and believe him. Hear another parable. There was a master of a house who planted a vineyard and put a fence around it and dug a wine press in it and built a tower and leased it to tenants and went into another country. And when the season for fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the tenants to get his fruit. And the tenants took his servants and beat one, killed another, and stoned another. Again, he sent other servants more than the first, and they, and they did the same to them. Now, who do you think he was talking about? He's talking about the Old Testament prophets that he had sent to tell and prepare the nation of Israel to get ready. The Messiah is coming. And what did they do? They ignored it. They did not listen. And you say, well, they didn't beat them. They threw Jeremiah in prison. There were some others that were beaten, but they ignored the thing. And then finally he sent his son to them saying, they will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him and have his inheritance. And they took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. And when therefore the owner of the vineyards comes, what will he do to those tenants? They said to him, he will put those wretches to a miserable death and let out the vineyard to other tenants to give him fruits in their season. Jesus said to them, have you never read the scriptures? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people producing its fruits. 
And the one who falls on the stone will be broken to pieces, and when it falls on anyone, it will crush him. And when the chief priest and the Pharisees heard his parables, they perceived, they were smarter than they thought, they understood he was talking about them. And although they were seeking to arrest him, they feared the crowds because they held him to be a prophet. What a story. And again, it's repeated in Luke and Mark. But the passage that grabbed me was when I was reading the one verse in the New Living Translation, and that's verse 42. Jesus said to them, have you never read the scriptures? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doings and is marvelous in our eyes. The New Living Translation says this, the stone rejected by the builders has now become the cornerstone. I think everybody here understands that's talking about Jesus. He was rejected and he has become the cornerstone. But this is this next phrase. This is the Lord's doing. And it's marvelous to see. I read this a few weeks ago. The Lord's doing. The Lord's doing. That he allowed them to reject him so that he could fulfill his ministry. That proved to me, Lou, that God cannot change, but he can change the circumstances. We look through the history. We've been studying it on Wednesday nights about uh, Ezra and Nehemiah and rebuilding the temple. Look what God did. He changed. He didn't change, but he changed the circumstances over and over and over again. Now you say, well, man, that's kind of scary. No, that's a blessing. I'm glad that I serve a God that loves me so much, the God that cannot change, the God that cannot fail, the God that cannot lie, loves me enough that he can change my circumstances so that I can do what God wants me to do. The God of the universe, Almighty God himself, he can't lie, but he can work on my behalf. Now, I wanted to make sure that I was reading this correctly. So I went to the King James Version and I went to Strong's Concordance to read it in the Greek. Looked up three key words. The first one I looked up was Lord, which says it's the Lord's doing. The word that's used for Lord there is kuros, K-U-R-I-O-S, which means the one who is in control. I think that has to be God. The one who is in control. And then it says doing, that word that's translated doing is the word that means come to pass or to come into existence. This is the Lord's doing. And then it's marvelous. The word marvelous, believe it or not, means marvelous. (laughs) Wonderful. Wonderful. So the almighty God himself, a God that cannot change, cannot fail, has adjusted things in our lives so that we can become all that God wants us to become. Convincing me that Father knows best. Father knows best. Because he came to do what? Jesus had one major job. It wasn't to heal the sick. He did. His major job was to come to seek and to save that which was lost. Peter reminds us of this in 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8, which says this. But do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that the Lord, with, with, with the Lord, one day is a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. That Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. That, what does it say? That 
He is not willing that any should perish. So what does that mean? That means he's willing to do anything to accomplish that will. Even to change your circumstance. Even, thank God, now, I, now we, none of us want to make mistakes. I said, none of us want to make mistakes. But aren't you glad that God can take our mistakes and make them into something good? You say, does he do that? Well, it says in the Bible, he's willing, able to take that which the enemy intended for evil and turn it into something good. So our God that's never changing is always changing our circumstances. And it's God that does that, not us. The Lord's doing. Mm. Wow. Peter also confirms that in this previous book, 1 Peter chapter 2, where he says this, chapter 2, verse 4. As you come to him, a living stone, rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious. Now, I, I take that to mean two things here. I think it can refer to Jesus. How many knows he was rejected? He was rejected by men. But how many of you ever been rejected? Been pushed aside, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious. You yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house, to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone. He's quoting. A cornerstone, chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. Amen. The stone that the builders had rejected has become the cornerstone. Goes on down verse 9, but you, because of believing in that rejected stone, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people of his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. What a blessing it is to know that God is able to change our circumstances. So what's so neat about that? For me, I'm glad to know that an all-knowing, mighty God can not only remove my sins, he can turn my failures into blessings. And I know some of you are saying the same thing I said. I don't understand it. I cannot comprehend the awesomeness of God. Lou, I can't, I can't imagine a God that knows everything before it ever happens. But I know it's true because he's proved it throughout the generations. He cannot lie, cannot change, but he can change circumstances and situations to bring people to him. So those fathers and mothers that have children in a way where guess what? God is able to change the circumstances. God's able to bring that about. And he is a God that not only can move sins, but he can turn our failures because every one of us, well, most of us, I know Gator probably is a perfect father, but the rest of us, we've made mistakes. We messed up. Oh, Bill, I'm sorry I left you out. And Bill, he's the other one. No, we've all messed up. We've all messed up. But I'm so glad that God's able to turn those messes into a message. I don't have to understand it. I said, I don't have to understand it. I don't have to be able to explain it. But I'm totally, totally convinced that Father knows best. But here's a very important question. Is he our Father? Huh? So certainly everybody is God's son. No, no, no. See, the, Jesus himself said this. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven but the one who does the will of my father who is in heaven in other words he said it's not everyone says daddy daddy that's going to get to go in heaven so ones that are obedient 
Galatians puts it this way. You are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. Faith in Christ Jesus. Our culture today, they'll try to tell you that you can get to heaven in many, many, many ways. But the book says, the only ones that's getting to go were the ones that say, Our Father. Not those that say, Lord, Lord. And even saying, Our, our, our Father, doesn't mean that they are legitimate. If I went down to Walmart today and was there in a toy section, a little kid came up to me and said, Hey, Daddy. How about buy me that toy? Now, if he was cute enough and nice enough and asked me plain enough, I might have bought it for him. But it wouldn't be because I was his daddy. It would be because I just had compassion on him. Now, if he came up to me and said, Daddy, buy me that $5,000 something, I'd say, go ask your own daddy. <laughs> huh? There's a lot of people calling out to God saying, our father, that he's not their God. He's not their father because they've never accepted him through the blood of Jesus Christ. So it's, it's, it's the truth. And the clearest and most concise of that is John chapter 1, where it says this in verse 10. John the Baptist speaking, John the Revelator writing it, he was in the world... And the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. And when we become the child of God, guess what? He becomes our father. And the Bible tells us over in Galatians, I believe it is, we can call him Abba, Father. Now the word for that is Daddy. That's the nearest thing that we have to that. Daddy. God's something personal. He is my Father, but He's my Daddy, and I can go to Him with my problems and my cares and concerns, and He's able to change that. Luke in the book of Acts says this in Acts chapter 4, verse 7. And when they had set them in the midst, this was Peter and John after the healing. And when they had set them in the midst, they inquired, by what power or by what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to him, or them, rulers of the people and elders, if we're being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed? Let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is what? The stone that was rejected by you, the builders which has become the cornerstone. And there's salvation and no one else for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. So Father knows best. How often do you think he may have intervened in your life and you didn't even know it? More importantly, how often has he changed us even after we made a mistake? It might have not have been a deliberate mistake, but I found out a bad choice is a bad choice, whether it's deliberate or not. Amen. Huh? I mean, you go out to a restaurant, doesn't matter if it's high class or low class, if you get food poisoning, it's a bad choice. But I'm so thankful that the God who never changes can change our circumstances, and He is a God that knows best. He is a father that knows best. Luke chapter 11 records what we call the Lord's Prayer. But it really should not be called the Lord's Prayer. In my opinion, it should be the disciples' prayer. It's the disciples said, Lord, teach us how to pray. See, 
To me, the Lord's Prayer is in John chapter 17, where Jesus prays for his disciples. But John chapter 11, or Luke chapter 11, it says, Our Father. That's where it starts. You've heard me say this before, and this is no offense to any of the rest of you, because I've heard a lot of you pray. I've heard a lot of great prominent men pray, and I believe God hears every one of them. But one of the most impactful prayers or prayers that I've ever heard is Joe Simons. He didn't call him Father. He said, Dear Sir. And if you've ever heard him pray, Gator, you know there was so much respect, honor, faith, all wrapped up in that, dear sir. He was confident. I told you my dad was not a Christian. He was a strong disciplinarian. But I can tell you how to get his attention. Hey, sir. You didn't get it by hollering at him. At least you, you'd get it, but it wasn't what you're looking for. <laughs> sir. Dear sir. And I think if we get nothing else from this, if we could realize the reverence we need to approach God by. He's our father. Now, I don't know, maybe yours would, but if you went to your dad really nasty and said, Hey, old man. Well, after I woke up. But you know, I hear people go to God with almost that attitude. I claim the Word of God. Yeah, you can claim it. You have that right. But I serve a God that loves you so much you don't need to claim it. You just need to ask Him. Father knows best. Our Father which art in heaven, holy be thy name. Thy kingdom come. <laughs> we, we could camp all day on any one of these phrases. Thy kingdom come. What's that mean? That means that we want what God wants more than what we want. On earth as it is in heaven. I can tell you, now this is just my opinion. You may disagree with me. I don't think that they're having the same problems in heaven that we're having here in the United States. For some reason, I don't, I don't think they've got hatred up there. I don't think there's bitterness. I don't think there's division or anger or frustration because Father knows best and they're doing what the Father wants. And I can tell you what, we need to pray for the kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Why? Because Father knows best. Give us this day our daily bread. <laughs> I think sometimes we, God, I, I, I want to be guaranteed bread for the rest of my life. Somebody talked to me, told me this morning that they were heard on the news this week that in order to be able to retire, you needed $1.3 million. Folks, I won't be retiring anytime soon. Huh? No, seriously, God's been so good to me. I'm on my second million. I gave up on the first one. <laughs> I gave up on the first one. And, you know, speaking of all you fathers, I, I, don't, I don't know what's remembered Father's Day now. But see, there was for a number of years that she, uh, Amanda mentioned that, that Father's Day was, what, 13th or 14th, way down the list of 15th, 16th, 16th. Yeah, right after Halloween, probably, the witches. But anyway. Uh, but you know what it used to be known for? Not anymore, but it used to be the number one day of all the year of collect phone calls. Now we just give them a cell phone so they don't have to collect anymore. <laughs> but Father knows best. Thy kingdom come, it will be done. Our daily bread. I don't know if you notice if you go through that, there's not a whole prayer list. 
Now, folks, don't misunderstand me. I believe in prayer, and I believe in taking our petitions to God in prayer. Strong me. Strong me. But have you noticed, if you read our prayer list, or if you overhear some people praying, they don't just ask God what he would do. They tell him how he needs to do it. We come to God with our list. God, I've got it figured out. If you do these 10 easy steps, be taken care of. Not my will, but thy will be done. Father knows best. Just go back to my main point. And I can tell you that I don't totally understand it. I cannot grasp it. But I'm so glad that my God loves me enough that he changes circumstances so he can change me. That's what he said. He said, these things were brought by God. God allowed them to resist him and reject him to open up eternity for all of us. Not just the Jews. Father knows best. And can I encourage you today as we close this service to acknowledge that. Quit trying to tell God what he needs to do for you. And ask him how you can please him. Because Father knows best. And he will change the circumstances. Maybe even do some miracles because our God's still in the miracle working business. But Father knows best. As our worship team comes, I want to ask, I'm going to ask all the fathers that are here, if you're willing to stand. I don't want to embarrass you, but I want us to pray for all the fathers. So all the fathers that are here, please just stand. You don't have to come to the front. But I want to pray for you, and I also want to give thanks to God for you. And I want all of those of you that are seated to just reach out your hand to all of these, how awesome it is. But I want a prayer, prayer of blessing and a prayer of challenge. Holy Father, every one of us fathers have failed. All of us have made mistakes. None are perfect. But Father, you've redeemed us. And you loved us enough that you tell us that we can call you Father. We can call you Abba Father, Daddy. Because you're concerned about our needs. You're concerned about our finances. You're concerned about our health. You're concerned about our children and grandchildren and relatives. So, Father, I pray for everyone, every one of the fathers that are here today. Let this day be a memorable one in their lives because they feel your touch. Feel your touch. Minister to them even right now is our prayer.